Lockwood & Co, 1899, Warrior Nun. Just some of the latest victims in a long line of Netflix originals to get the axe after just one or two seasons. And these were shows that had dedicated fan bases, critical success, and had spent weeks on Netflix's top 10. And I was actually looking forward to watching 1899, so Netflix, why are you doing this? Why are you canceling these popular shows? I actually went to your FAQ to, to see if I could find an answer and it kind of just led me in a circle a whole bunch, so guess I'm gonna have to figure it out for myself. Yeah. All right, I think I have an answer. Or a few. Completion rate is largely what it sounds like. It's a percentage of people who watch an entire season out of everyone who started it. The idea being that shows with a high completion rate bring back a larger audience for future seasons. Though this does have a side effect. Leaving a series unfinished or exiting a show midway through is just as bad if not worse than having never started the series in the first place, at least in the eyes of the algorithm. Now, while Netflix is happy to release the kind of data they use to make their decisions, they rarely release the actual data itself because that's a trade secret. But there are third parties who claim they can track this kind of data. Digital Eye, a London-based analytics company, surveyed roughly 1,000 Netflix accounts across all of Europe. And looking at their data, a clear trend begins to emerge. Shows with over 50% completion rate make the cut, and everything else is canned. Even shows with smaller audiences can get renewed over larger ones if more of that audience watches all the way through. But that's not the whole story. In 2021, Netflix released information on adjusted view per share, or AVS, which they describe as the primary measure of a title's impact. It's basically how much of a show's viewership compares to the total viewership of Netflix, modified for what they deem are more valuable viewers. And no, valuable viewers aren't some secret cabal of wealthy donors or trend-setting elite. At least we're pretty sure it's not. Netflix didn't actually release the specific calculations that go into determining AVS, but both current and former employees say that it's actually new customers, and customers who don't use the service as often that are considered more valuable. The idea being that the shows they choose to watch are the reasons they choose to remain customers. Netflix then takes AVS and uses it to determine a show's efficiency which is how much adjusted viewership a show brings in compared to its cost. Now, this is going to be a bunch of numbers, so just bear with me for a minute. For example, Dave Chappelle's Six and Stones cost 23.6 million and had an AVS of 12. So Netflix, using their formula, gave it an efficiency score of 0.8. Bo Burnham's Inside cost only 3.8 million to make and had an AVS of 10, giving it an efficiency score of 2.8. And you can see how this gets tricky. Even though Inside was vastly more efficient, it drew in less value overall simply because it's more niche than Sticks and Stones, which technically cost more than it made, but drew in more values worth of viewership. This is a network's predicament made plain. Netflix can't spend its whole budget on a few massive titles because of the risk. These shows typically have slimmer margins, and if they fail, they fail spectacularly. They'll have lost a ton of investment, get a bunch of negative press, and made nothing else for their customers to watch. But it can't just make efficient niche shows either, because those shows don't draw on enough viewership to grow the platform. So Netflix has to find a middle ground between low cost, high efficiency shows and high cost, high viewership shows. Well, Actually, the ideal scenario is a low-cost, high-viewership show, like Squid Game, which had an efficiency score of 41.7 and had the largest Netflix debut by more than 50 million viewers. But that is more the anomaly than the norm. Regardless, nowhere in this equation is there room for expensive niche shows, and shows that rely heavily on VFX and animation are typically more expensive. So they're more vulnerable to cancellation simply because they aren't cost effective for the viewership they generate. Or as Sarandos put it earlier this year, you have to be able to talk to a small audience on a small budget, and a large audience at a large budget. 
So that's the answer. All this data and analytics and algorithms, it's all about opportunity costs. Netflix tracks what people watch because there's only so much money to go around. And spending that money on a show that not many people are watching is the same as taking it away from a show that many people could. So Netflix has to be meticulous in determining their programming to make sure they maximize their viewership. But why? Now this next part is firmly my conjecture. There's only so much you can definitively know through interviews and financial reports. But to me, it seems like a lot of the frustrations people have with Netflix right now are a result of Netflix trying to expand its profitability and all the changes that come with that. The only way for Netflix to get more revenue is to get more subscriptions or to get more money from those subscriptions. Hence the price hikes, the advertising tiers, and the end to password sharing. At the same time, Netflix is still trying to grow, to reach more people in more markets. But Netflix has been a global brand for nearly a decade. Their problem isn't product awareness. If you're inclined to pay for their subscription, you almost certainly have by now. Their problem is convincing people who don't believe their service is worth it, that it is. A difficult task made even more difficult with a market now oversaturated with competitors. And those competitors have bought back most of the pre-existing properties of Note from Netflix to put on their own streaming services. So Netflix's best option to entice potential customers while still expanding profitability is to make a lot of originals, more than any of their competitors. Some of them are duds, of course, that's just the nature of the business, but most are good and interesting shows that people are excited to watch and to sign up for. They even talk up the quality and the diversity of their programming in their shareholder letters, but all of this just makes it even more crushing when these shows are canceled, simply because more than 50% of the people didn't watch all the way through, or not enough new customers signed up to watch it. That Sarandos quote from earlier about budgets, he started that by saying, we have never canceled a successful show. A lot of these shows were well-intentioned, but spoke to a very small audience on a very big budget. At no point in any of these articles or interviews did the actual substance or relevancy or artistry of a show ever come up when talking about why a show was canceled. Because the cold, hard truth is that a show's story, its ratings, its fan base, never even come into consideration. Because Netflix can't write a Rotten Tomatoes score on a check to its investors. Which, you know, I get. It's a business. But still, it's a little upsetting. And this is the crux of the problem. On paper, Netflix and its audience have compatible goals to make and watch a lot of good television. But the definition of what makes TV good isn't totally aligned. To Netflix, good TV is a show that draws in the crowds and keeps people watching. And so Netflix produces a lot of series looking for those holy grails, those Squid Games and Wednesdays and Night Agents. As a result, it's treating its season ones like pilot seasons, testing the waters and hoping their hits. The ones that manage to keep a majority of their audience watching at a relatively low cost also stay on and the rest of them get the axe. But that's not really what audiences want. Remember, the audience is a bunch of individuals with their own personal experience. And to most individuals, how popular a show is is only one part of why they choose to watch it. People are also looking for shows with characters, ideas, and conflicts that pique their interest and allow them to get invested in the story. Sometimes that's a universal experience. Most of the time, it isn't. Back when pilot episodes were the standard, this was a fairly low buy-in for the customer. Maybe an hour or so of your time, and with the clear expectation that this show idea was on a trial basis. But pilot seasons are not pilot episodes. They require significantly more time and emotional investment and they don't come with the buyer beware label. So when a customer commits to signing up for a new service, watches all of that new show, and engages in all the hype around it, 
only for that show to be cancelled. It can feel cold-hearted and oddly personal. And when this happens again and again and again, it's a kind of pattern that can affect the way we watch television. In fact, it already has. Over a quarter of Americans now wait for a show's finale to be released before starting the series, specifically because they're afraid it will be cancelled. And honestly, I count myself among them. I didn't start 1899 for that exact reason. The real danger here is that this creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. Audiences are hesitant to watch new shows because they're afraid they will be cancelled, leading to those shows having less viewership and less completion rate, resulting in those shows being cancelled, further perpetuating audience paranoia. A problem soon to be compounded, as Netflix is wrapping up a majority of its temple series. By the end of this year, the longest running, active original series will be Big Mouth, and it will be the only original series with more than four seasons. So, I might suggest to Netflix, or to any streaming service for that matter, that its greatest asset is not the popularity of any single series, but rather the strength of its library, and that investing in a well-developed catalog of unique shows that a person can spend months watching all of is worth more than the short-term strategy of chasing hits that so often polarizes customers. Or at the very least, give these shows a season or a half season to wrap up their storylines so that your catalog doesn't become a graveyard of unfinished shows that no one will watch, let alone sign up for. And the most frustrating part about all of this is that Netflix knows this. Right now, as of recording, on their investor website, it says this. We believe we have a major advantage in launching a series. A show that is taking a long time to find its audience is one that we can keep nurturing. This allows us to prudently commit to a whole season, rather than just a pilot episode. Do you think this video will ruin any chance I have at working at Netflix?